So now that we've talked about the structure of DNA, we're going to talk about how DNA copies itself, which is called replication. Now, when does this happen? Why does DNA need to do this? Well, remember, anytime a cell is going to reproduce, each new cell needs a copy of the DNA information. So this is where, during S of the cell cycle, a chromosome would go from looking like a stick to looking like an X. So we're going to talk now on a molecular level about how this happens. Now, the, the model that we follow is called the semi-conservative model, and it was discovered by Messelson and Stahl. They did a very famous experiment, which you do need to understand. And uh, so what, in essence, what happens is you start with an original DNA strand. It unwinds and it opens up because DNA, remember, the, the two sides are just connected with hydrogen bonds, not very strong. It's going to open up. You have nucleotides floating around in the nucleus to build two new matches to those original strands. And so you're going to end up with two new DNA molecules. Each one is going to consist of one original strand and one new strand. So it looks something like this. This is my original strand. The hydrogen bonds are going to break. It's a little more complicated than this, but it's going to open up. Nucleotides are going to come in. They are going to replace the missing side, and we're going to end up with two new strands. Each one consists of one original strand and one brand new strand. Now, remember, it's going to know what goes there because for every A, what's going to come floating in that will attach properly to an A is going to be a T. For every G, a C is going to come in. So this way you're going to get an exact copy of each of the two strands. This is a, another diagram of what it looks like. Again, it's called semi-conservative. Now, when Messelson and Stahl did their experiment, they actually had a couple of hypotheses. They weren't sure how DNA copied itself. One of their hypotheses was this one, that it was semi-conservative. But they had a second hypothesis, that the DNA replication was completely conservative. And you do need to know what that means and what they would have expected to happen. So if DNA replication was conservative, what that would mean is this, the DNA would start off like this, and the original DNA would never ever open or change. It would just be used as a template for a new DNA to be built. So this one would be, it's sort of like going to a photocopy machine. So this would be like a template, this would be the new one, you'd have one fully consisting of original DNA, and then one fully consisting of new DNA that was built by sort of looking at this one and making a photocopy. So that was the conservative hypothesis. And what I'm going to show you is that in their experiment, they disproved that one. So let me explain their experiment. So what they did was they took E. coli and they grew it in a heavy isotope of nitrogen. Now the purpose of the isotope in this experiment is different than when they used the radioactive isotopes in the previous experiment. That was to use them as tracers. They would glow. They would be able to see where the DNA and the protein went. That's not the purpose here. In this case, they're using two different weights of nitrogen because this way the DNA will weigh a different amount, okay? So remember, and why nitrogen? Well, because remember, part of DNA, every single uh, nucleotide contains nitrogen bases. So if we grow E. coli in this heavy nitrogen, its DNA, all the nitrogen bases in its DNA will contain nitrogen 15, which weighs a little bit more than normal nitrogen, and its DNA will be sort of heavier than regular DNA. Okay, so imagine you've got this bacteria, and its DNA is a bit heavier than normal. Then what you do is you switch the bacteria over, and you provide them with only regular nitrogen-14, which is lighter in weight, when they go to reproduce. So you would know by weight if, they're, uh, if they were making new DNA, it would weigh less than the original DNA because it would contain nitrogen that had a slightly lighter weight. So after a couple of generations, I'll show you what they did. They stopped it sort of after one generation, after two generations, after three generations. They took the samples of the DNA. They broke up the bacteria, they extracted the DNA, and they mixed it with something called cesium chloride, which you're not going to be tested on the chemical. But the important part is they centrifuged it. They spun it in a centrifuge. So in a centrifuge, if you're not familiar with it, it's a little machine. I can put samples in it. You spin it in a circle. It spins around in a circle. And the heavier something is, the further down it will sink. For example, they can separate your blood 
with a centrifuge. If you don't eat blood, your blood just looks like it's all red in that test tube. After they spin it in a centrifuge, all your red blood cells end up at the bottom, all clumped together because they're heavy. Then you get a layer of white blood cells, and then above that you have the plasma, the liquid part. So when you spin a centrifuge, the heaviest stuff will be on the bottom, and then you'll actually get layers. All right, so imagine that this is what they did with their DNA samples. Okay, so here's an actual picture of what they did, and let me explain what you're looking at here. So this is their, so they take their original DNA, they've grown it in heavy nitrogen. They extract the DNA from the bacteria, they spin it in a centrifuge, see the liquid in here, and the DNA sinks all the way down here because it's heavy. Um, so this is my, sort of like my standard. Now I know anytime I have DNA, a double-stranded DNA that's weight that's made out of completely out of nitrogen 15, it's going to sink to the bottom. Now what they did is they let that DNA replicate. So now imagine, here's my original DNA with grown in nitrogen 15. So this is heavy. Now if DNA replication was conservative, remember that was one of their hypotheses, then here's what would have happened. The original DNA would have served as a template, that's nitrogen 15. The new DNA, which would have been built out of nitrogen 14, because that was the only uh, isotope available to build new DNA. So here's my original DNA, it would have been made purely out of nitrogen 15. My newly formed DNA would have been made out of nitrogen 14. And if I spun this in a centrifuge, what I would have expected to see is one band down here, and one band up here. So after the bacteria reproduced for one round, I would find one low band and one high band. Why? The low band would be for the original DNA in the original bacteria, and then after they reproduced the new DNA that was sort of like a photocopy of it, it would have been made out of nitrogen 14, and it would have been up here. Guess what? That's not what they saw. So that's how they disproved that conservative replication uh, was the way that DNA copied itself. But that's what they would have seen. They would have seen a band down here and a band up here. So instead, what they saw was a band in the middle. Well, that makes sense. So let's think about this for a second. So let's go back um, and look at what's going to happen when the DNA replicates. And I know there's already a drawing of this here. So if DNA replication is semi-conservative, we have DNA fully made out of nitrogen 15, right? The DNA opens up. New bases come in, but they're made of nitrogen 14, a lighter weight nitrogen. Now, isn't it true if I was to weigh these, they're not going to be heavy because they're not purely made out of 15, and they're not going to be light either because they're not purely made out of 14. They're going to actually weigh somewhere right in between because they consist of one half DNA with nitrogen 15 and one half DNA with nitrogen 14. And so this is what they saw after one generation when they extracted the DNA from the bacteria, they saw a band right in the middle. And then they took this a step further. But that in itself would imply that DNA replication is semi-conservative. My DNA weighs exactly right in the middle because it consists of one heavy strand and one light strand. Now, they let this go on for more generations. So what's going to happen when this replicates again? Well, this is the F1. Now I'm going to let it replicate a second time. So the DNA is going to, the original DNAs are now going to open again, right? Like this. But remember, this side of this DNA was already made out of light nitrogen, right? This was already made out of 14. So what's going to happen when I, again, still only have not regular nitrogen 14 available to make the new side? Here's what I'm going to get. I'm actually going to get... Uh, two bands now, not just one band in the middle. I'm going to get a band in the middle again here, and then I'm going to now get a band at the top because these two strands are going to be made out of purely nitrogen 14. And if I let this keep going generation after generation, what I would find is more and more and more, like a thicker and thicker and thicker band at the top because I would have more and more and more and more bacteria being made that have purely nitrogen 14. But technically this band in the middle would never go away, right? Because my original DNA, every time this replicates, 
this original, original, original strand is going to also get replicated. All right, so that is their experiment. Um, make sure you know the difference between conservative, what they would have expected to get. I'll repeat it one more time. So if it had been conservative and we started with nitrogen 15, after one generation, we would have still had our original purely intact, still made out of nitrogen 15, and then we would have had a new strand made out of nitrogen purely out of DNA uh, bases that contained nitrogen 14. And what they would have seen in the centrifuge after they spun this out would have been one heavy band and one light band. Instead, it, because it was semi-conservative, the old DNA, the original DNA opened up. I keep swapping out my colors here, right? So this is my nitrogen 15. This opens up. I'm actually going to go ahead and draw the next one too. And after one generation, what we're going to end up with is a DNA that's half and half. Well, two DNAs technically that are made half and half. So I'm going to end up with at the F1, one band right in the middle because the, the band is representing all the DNA is floating to the same spot. Okay, so this band, if, even if I had 10 of these, it would just be a thicker band. It would still sink to the same spot. Um, if I let this reproduce again, this is going to open up like this to my F2. This is going to open up again like this, and I'm still going to end up with that one band in the middle because of these on the end. But I'm now going to also get a band at the top. And so you end up with this, a middle band and a top band. And if I was to let this keep going for 10 more generations, as you can imagine, I'm going to get more and more and more of these that are purely made out of the nitrogen 14, right? But I'm still going to never ever get rid of that middle one. I'm going to have that one little tiny band. Oops. So I'm going to still have a band in the middle, but then the band at the top is going to get thicker and thicker because I'm going to have more and more and more copies of DNA that consists of, sorry, it's getting really sloppy, but um, that consists purely of 14. So I'm going to get a very thick band at the top, but I'm still going to have this half and half band in the middle. It's never going to go away. All right. So that's Messelson Stahl's experiment, and that is um, semi conservative replication.